And last week, uh, we've been given some background of the history of what's going on behind these prophecies. And last week in chapter 7, the prophet Isaiah confronts the king of Judah, uh, Ahaz, for not trusting in the Lord. Ahaz was under the threat, a uh, northern threat. You think of Judah, the two tribes to the south, uh, they were in where Jerusalem is. And they were under threat not only from Aram, which is Syria, but also Aram and Israel, the other 10 tribes to the north, had uh, allied themselves with one another and they were coming against Ahaz. And Ahaz, we find this in 1 Kings, uh, was a, a man that uh, decided to not trust the Lord in this threat, but to go to the superpower of the day, the Assyrians, and align with them against the, these two other uh, enemies to his north. And, uh, and yet there's no need to do that. Uh, the Lord promises to defeat those, those enemies, Israel and Aram to the north. Uh, he promises to do that. And he gives Ahaz two signs. He gives them the sign of uh, Isaiah's son, which means a remnant will return. In other words, there will be a time of severing, but there will be a return. There will be a redemption. God will not leave his people. And then the second sign is the Alma, the virgin will conceive and bear a son. Now we know ultimately that's fulfilled in Jesus who is both among us, with us, by being among us and by being for us, uh, by, with us by God being one of us, he actually literally becomes one of us, with us that much and then also is on our side as well and not just is one of us but is for us in Christ. And so we find the person and work of Christ in, in that phrase, Emmanuel, God with us. But chapter 8 is a follow-up to chapter 7, not only just because it follows it, but it Ahaz fades from the view in chapter 8. But uh, the, the threat of Assyria has not gone away. Assyria is a mighty, cruel power, and it becomes front and center in this uh, chapter. And here the prophet is addressing um, the lack of trust that now Judah has, the people of Judah have for their God in the midst of this threat. And then tells of the consequences of this lack of trust. And so the connection between the two chapters is pretty plain because we find the Emmanuel phrase given two times in chapter eight. It follows up chapter seven, verse 14. And also that it is given another son, a second son, who has a meaningful name, a name that will be assigned for Judah, uh, uh, the son, second son of Isaiah. So basically in chapter eight, you have two uh, sections. You have the first 10 verses, which talk about Damascus and Samaria, which is basically talking about the, the city. Damascus is, is the, the capital of Aram, and you find Samaria, the capital of Israel to the north. And their threat is not going to happen. We still get that. And yet, there will be a flood into Judah by the Assyrians. The second part of the chapter, starting with verse 11, uh, tells how uh, Isaiah and his disciples are to respond to all this. There's going to be, uh, on one hand, hence salvation. Uh, Judah won't be uh, overwhelmed by these two northern enemies, but there will be the flood of Assyria coming. How do we respond in times of difficulty when the church is under um, duress, when the church is under uh, stress and discipline? Uh, it talks in this second part, 11 through 22, of the disciples, of uh, the children that have been given to Isaiah, to a faithful, righteous uh, remnant. So hear the word of the Lord uh, from chapter 8. This is indeed God's living, uh, truthful word. The Lord said to me, take a large scroll and write on it with an ordinary pen. Mahir, Shalal, Hashbaz. And I will call uh, in Uriah the priest and Zechariah the son of Jebariah as reliable witnesses for me. Then I went to the prophetess and she conceived and gave birth to a son. And the Lord said to me, name him Mahir Shalal Hashbaz. Before the boy knows how to say my father or my mother, the wealth of Damascus and the plunder of Samaria 
will be carried off by the king of Assyria. The Lord spoke to me again. Because this people has rejected the gently flowing waters of Shiloh and rejoices over Rezin and the son of Ramaliah, therefore the Lord is about to bring against them the mighty floodwaters of the river, the king of Assyria with all his pomp. He will overflow all its channels. It will overflow all its channels, run over all its banks, and sweep on into Judah, swirling over it, passing through it, and reaching up to the neck. Its outspread wings will cover the breadth of your land. Oh, Emmanuel. Rise the, the war cry, you nations, and be shattered. Listen, all you distant lands, prepare for battle and be shattered. Prepare for battle and be shattered. Devise your strategy, but it will be thwarted. Propose your plan, but it will not stand, for God is with us. The Lord spoke to me with his strong hand upon me, warning me not to follow the way of this people. He said, do not call conspiracy everything these people call conspiracy. Do not fear what they fear. Do not dread it. The Lord Almighty is the one you were to regard as holy. He is the one you are to fear. He is the one you are to dread. And he will be a sanctuary. But for both houses of Israel, he will be a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. And for the people of Jerusalem, he will be a trap and a snare. Many of them will stumble. They will fall and be broken. They will be snared and captured. Bind up the testimony. Seal up the law among my disciples. I will wait for the Lord who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob. I will trust Put my trust in him. Here I am, and the children the Lord has given me. We are signs and symbols in Israel from the Lord Almighty who dwells on Mount Zion. When men tell you to consult mediums and spiritists who whisper and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God? Why consult the dead on behalf of the living? To the law and to the testimony. If they do not speak according to this word, they have no light of dawn. Distressed and hungry, they will roam through the land. When they are famished, they will become enraged and looking upward will curse their king and their God. Then they will look toward the earth and see only distress and darkness and fearful gloom and they will be thrust into utter darkness. So when's the reading? God's word. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you would anoint these words you have given us so many years ago, nearly 3,000 years ago. Isaiah was there speaking these to your people. And now you've preserved them. They've been bound up. They've been sealed up so that we can now hear them today so that we might run to the law and the testimony. We might be your disciples. Oh, Lord, strengthen us now. May we hear your word. May we hear you speaking to us through it, calling us to yourself, warning us, encouraging us, causing us to keep going. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The question in your title of the sermon this morning is, can the church lose the faith? And that all depends on how you define the church, isn't it? If the church is defined as those whom God has loved and chosen and saved, of course not. The church can never lose the faith. They are saved, and that's just that. They are saved and can't be not saved. They can't be unsaved once you're saved. But if you define the church as the community of God's people, as an institution, as a a grouping, a gathering, the answer, of course, is yes. Churches throughout history have lost their lampstands, have not been faithful, have ceased from being a church because they've wandered from the faith. And therefore, there's two ways of looking at the church. One as the people who confess the faith 
And secondly, as the people who confess the faith and believe that faith. The churches in our confession uses the, dis the distinction of the visible church and the invisible church. The visible church is how we see the church. Uh, the invisible church is how God sees the church. Uh, the visible church is what we see. The, the, the invisible church is what only God can tell. For he knows those who are his own. He can read the heart. We can't do that. And so the visible church is, is not synonymous with the invisible church. Because not everyone in the visible church believes. We know that. I've had people come to me and say, I've confessed Christ before. I thought I never came to Christ and believed him here at Valley Press until years later. So we know that there's a mixed body of the church. And Jesus talked about wheat and tares in his parable. And we're not to pull them up. They were to leave them there uh, as far as we know until the end. And the invisible church, this is the other air we can have with this distinction, is to think that the invisible church is another church, really. No, there's only one church. It's one church, visible and invisible. And it's that, that uh, uh, invisible church is the elect within the church, but it's still one church. And our confession gives it this way. It says, the Catholic or universal church, which is invisible, consists of the whole number of the elect. The visible church, it goes on, which is also Catholic and universal, consists of all those throughout the world that profess the true religion and of their children. And then it goes on to explain a bit. It says that this Catholic church has been, remember it's one church, this Catholic church has been sometimes more and sometimes less visible. And particular churches which are members thereof are more or less pure. And there's, there's church difficulty within the church. There's no pure church. There's no perfect church. Someone said that you, uh, there's no perfect church. We know that because if we joined it, then it wouldn't be perfect anymore, right? And he goes on to say, the purest churches under heaven are subject both to mixture, a mixture of error, and some have so degenerated as to become no churches of Christ, but synagogues of Satan. Nevertheless, there shall always be uh, the, the church on earth. And why do I bring up this distinction? It's because chapter 8 reminded me of this. In verses 1 through 10, it basically refers to the visible church. It refers to the nation of Israel, to Judah at the time, uh, to both houses of Israel as mentioned, or the house of Jacob. Verse 6 talks about these people as this people who have rejected me. Verse 11 talks about these people who follow another way. Verse 15 talks about many of them who will stumble. It's the present state of the nation of, Is of Judah right now that he's talking about, or in the end of Israel. It's the present state of the church in the Old Testament, the visible church. But then it switches in verse 11, and it talks about those who are, in verse 16, my disciples. Uh, whether that's God's disciples or Isaiah's disciples, it makes no difference. It's still the disciples that are distinguished from Israel and Judah. And then verse 8 talks about the children the Lord has given me. This is the remnant that we've been hearing about throughout the book of Isaiah. This uh, invisible church, if you will. Those who trust the Lord. The remnant that Paul says are chosen by grace even today. We saw this in Isaiah 1.9 when it said, Unless the Lord Almighty had left us some survivors, we would have become like Sodom. We saw it in chapter 1, verse 27, of the redeemed are ones who are the penitent ones, the ones who repent, whereas the rest of Israel was not doing that. We saw it in chapter 3, verse 10, tell the righteous, it will be well with them. There's a the group of the righteous. In chapter 4, verse 2, we saw another mention of the survivors in Israel. And then we'll see in chapter 10, verse 21, that a remnant will return, a remnant of Jacob will return. There's always going to be God's people within God's people. And this kind of can be confusing when we read the Old Testament that way. Paul does a wonderful job in Romans to talk about that. In chapter 2, verse 28, he says, a man is not a Jew if he is only one outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a man is a Jew if he is one inwardly. There he makes an outward-inward distinction. Visible church, invisible church. No man is a, a Jew if he is one uh, 
if he's one inwardly, and circumcision is of the heart. In other words, everyone's circumcised, but there's a circumcision of the heart that turns to the Lord and turns away from evil. Paul said in Romans uh, 9, 6 again, not all are, who are descended from Israel are Israel. So we have this visible, invisible distinction. And, and they're going along, the visible church and the invisible church are going along in the same direction, but they're really on two different roads. And eventually those roads will diverge. And the ones who are not truly believing will go their own way. And we find this in this first 10 verses. Verse one says that Isaiah is told to make it known what God is going to do. He's posting it on the internet of his day. It's a large, it could be translated placard. Put up there the name of his second son, which means quick to the plunder, swift to the spoil. Or one uh, paraphrase, Phillips calls it quick pickling, picking, pickling, easy prey, right? Like better, easy pickings easy prey. That's what it's saying here, that that God's people, the visible church, and since there's only one church, the the true believers within that church are going to be under distress. And they're going to be Assyria's next victim. And this is what the meaning of Isaiah's second son means. The prophetess, probably his wife, Uh, becomes the the message. She she is really the mother of the message as a prophetess. And she uh, says that uh, and uh, this child will, before they're able to speak, before they're two years old or a year and a half, children speak at slightly different ages, but before that time comes, this present threat of the north, Aram and Israel, will be over because they'll be gone. They'll be over. So it's both the meaning of the name and the moment that he speaks his first words, what will be, remind them that this is exactly ha- what happened. This prophecy is in 734, we believe, and that that same year, that great mighty king of Assyria, uh, Tilig Pelezer uh, uh, III, came into the area. And he, in 733, he came through the northern parts of Galilee and, and Gilead. We're told this in 2 Kings uh, chapter uh, 16. And, uh, sorry, chapter 15. And, and then uh, Damascus falls too in 732. So within two years, again, exactly what the prophets said, uh, given time for nine months of, of bearing uh, the child and getting him ready, this is what the Lord of the Lord says. What do they do? In other words, God gives people time. It means that Judah will have time to reflect on this. What did they do? Well, verses 5 through 8 tell us they go the way of their king, Ahaz. They reject the gentle flowing waters of Shalom. Now, what does that mean? Well, you know that word Shalom, don't you? Or shal- um, the, the pool of Shalom. Remember that in the New Testament where Jesus heals a person that you can go there today? I've been there. The very southern tip of the old city of Jerusalem is a pool. And that what supplies that pool is uh, the Gihon Spring, which is outside, actually, the old city walls, and it flows in. Hezekiah later, after Isaiah, made Hezekiah's tunnel that you can walk through today. It's an amazing tunnel of about a quarter of a mile that they dug out of the, the rock and brought the water from outside the city into the city. But this is before all that. But the water still was the water supply of Jerusalem. And so the pool of Shalom is talking of the gentle way in which God supplied his people and gave them help and gave them water support in in Jerusalem. And they're rejecting that. They're they're rejecting God's gentle support and his help and the source that they need. And they're rejoicing over Israel. And because of this, they will be almost overcome by the flood water. See the contrast there? The gentle waters flowing in Jerusalem they reject, but they take on, because of that, the floodwaters of the mighty superpower of Assyria. The waters of the Euphrates will overflow. Not literally, it's talking about it will flow. That Judah will be, be up to their necks in Assyrians, up to their necks in these enemies who are, are cruel and malicious. And then it switches very quickly in verse 8 to another image of Assyria like a giant bird of prey hovering over the land, covering the land, shadowing the land. Get this feeling 
No wonder they call out, Emmanuel. It's a call of help there in verse 8. A cry of, uh, to God for the Messiah, to the Lord to save them in the midst of the discipline that he puts on their lives. And so Judah chooses poorly both their king and the people. And when we choose the world, when we choose not to trust God, we choose poorly. When we choose the world, we get the world. It floods into our lives. It looms over us. It overwhelms us. And we wonder if we're a Christian at all. Yet even when God must discipline his visible church and the invisible church along with it, his church has hope. God is always preserving a remnant. God won't let his church die. Notice how they're up to their necks, but they're not drowned. Did you pick that up? Yeah, the Lord lets it go only so far in our lives of discipline. The world would overcome us, verse 9 and 10. The world raises up its war cry to us and against us. But then notice how three times they're going to be shattered, shattered, shattered. The world devises its strategy. Our enemies come at us with their plans, but they will come to nothing. Why? Again, the call, Emmanuel. Again, the call for Messiah. Because God is with us, that's why. Because he is, he is the one who has the world in his hands and therefore has us in his hands. And who, who is speaking really in verses 9 and 10? I think it's God's people, the remnant, the invisible church. These are the people who are crying out. They're saying, raise your battle cry. Do your worst to us. Give us your best shot, O world. Come at us with all you've got. Plan your plans and devise your strategy, but it will come to nothing because God is with us. Do you see this? That's true in your life, Christian. The plans of your enemies, the plans of your great enemy, Satan, will come to naught because God is with you. It's a version of Romans 8. What then should we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He did not despair his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? This is you, Christian. You, you're saying chapter, chapter 8, verse 9 and 10. This is the, the, the call of the righteous who can stand up and say, no, my God is stronger than anything that can come against me, no matter what it is. Well, this is to summarize so far. Verses one through three, we find the discipline is coming, seen by the sign of the second son of Isaiah. Verses four through eight, discipline is deserved. It's seen by the contrast of these two waters, the rejection of a gentle stream that will supply for them as they trust the Lord and that flood water of, of discipline from Assyria. And then verses eight through 10, the discipline is controlled. It's only up to the neck. It's seen by these two Emmanuel cries in verse 8 and in verse 10. The question is, what is the remnant to do in the midst of times like this? In such times as this of church discipline, of God's judgments happening, and they do happen, how are we to act? And that's what verse 11 and following is saying. We're not to follow the way of the worldly church. We're not to follow the wayward church. We're not to follow the visible church if it's in error in any way from God's word. Verse 12, the worldly church worries. This is the characteristic of the worldly church. They live in fear. They live by fear, a fear of the future, a fear of getting some terrible disease, of, of fear of losing their job, a fear of other people and what other people think of you, and ultimately a fear of death. But the remnant fear God. Do you see that? The remnant fear what God thinks of them over than what others think of them. They fear God. And again, we have to always define that the fear of God mentioned so often in Scripture is not that we as God's people cringe and cower under him. That's not the image. But it is one of which we stop in our tracks because we know God is God. And there will be consequences to our actions. 
We all do that. We must stop and realize that God is holy, that he's other than any other. And to defy him is never going to be inconsequential. It's always going to have its effects. This is why this verse is quoted. Do not fear what they fear. Do not be frightened. It's quoted, remember, in 1 Peter when we went through that in chapter 3? When it's talking about doing the good, even though you may suffer for it, even though there's difficult times. It says, do not fear, do not be frightened, but in your hearts acknowledge Christ as holy Lord. Realize he's your Lord. He's the holy one. He's the one that we're to be appealing to and thinking about what he thinks. We're to wonder about what God thinks, not what others think. We're to hang upon his word. Raymond Orton and I have been reading in Isaiah, he's been very, very wonderful to read, very pastoral and devotional. He says, dare to treat God as God. Don't respond to life in a way that makes God look helpless and weak and worthless. Living emotionally as if God were not really our savior is practical atheism. If God is God, he is all that finally matters. The remnant respects God enough to live that way. Is that the way you're living? If not, make a resolution today. Tell the Lord today, I'm gonna to start fearing you rather than other things and other people. I'm gonna think, I'm gonna care about what you think. That's what the, the, the visible church, it's not of the Lord, the worldly church will always go into, but that's not us. That's not what the remnant does. Well, secondly, look at verse 14. Another characteristic of uh, the remnant in the midst of discipline is that God is our sanctuary. Now, the temple, and this is the word for temp, the temple here. The temple was used for many things. It was the presence of God was there, the worship of God. It was the place of meeting God, of the sacrifices. It was a place of, of instruction. It was a place of gathering. But it also was a place of refuge, you might remember in 1 Kings 1 where Adoniah uh, tries, to, tries to take the kingship away from Solomon and Solomon succeeds by the Lord's will. And Adoniah, what does he do? But he runs to the temple and holds on to the horns of the altar. It was a place of refuge. And the Lord wants us to see him as our place of refuge. Psalm 27, 5 says, for in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling, in his temple. He will hide me in the shelter of his tabernacle and set me high upon a rock. Run to the Lord. Don't run to other places, escape things in your life. Run to the Lord, make him your sanctuary. Run to him, hide in him, find your salvation in him. But, of course, the, mid, the, the mere confessors of the faith will stumble over the Lord. God is re either going to be your standing stone or your stumbling stone. He's either going to be a sanctuary to you or he's going to be a snare to you. And people go on and on. They'll, as he says here, they'll criticize God. They'll cry out to God in anger. Why does God allow this? Why does God not do that? Why, why can't we live the way we want and still be his? Why, why can't we see more of him now? All the questions that people in the worldly church ask. Why can't synchronism, can't, why can't I bring a little Christianity and a little my philosophy and a little my friend's philosophy together? And why wouldn't that be pleasing to God? Exactly what Israel's doing. And God says, no, I'm holy. It's all or nothing with me. You're either for me or you're against me. And this is why such brokenness happens in the, in the church. Some of you have experienced that in churches that, that go the worldly way, that go the way Israel was going. And the brokenness that happens, the enslavement that occurs, the mindset that, that deviates from the word of scripture. You see, we can't get away from God. We all are going to have to face him and all do face him. In fact, as I was thinking this week, I was thinking, in fact, that really everybody has a relationship with God. And it even is personal. It's just a matter of what kind of relationship. Is God your savior or are you your savior? Are, is God your savior or is, is we really 
your judge. The question is, do we flee to him as our sanctuary? Or do we flee from him? Oh, that the, you might be part of that remnant that trusts the Lord and then just give verbal consent to it. But, but, but trust him when it's cost you something, when it's difficult. Well, look at two that they bind up. Thirdly, in verse 16, they bind up and seal scripture. In other words, there are people who go to the word. They're people of the word. There are people who are saying, what does the Bible say? And they're not just saying that to be pious. They're, they're saying that because they really want to know what God thinks. And this sealing up, is, it shows us that the book of the word, in this case, Isaiah's prophecy, is, is a separate book. It's a different book from all other books. It's not that we just gather things from scripture and things from Buddha and things from other and put them together and mix up something that we like. No, we hold to the word because it's God's word. And we wait on God. We wait for God to show his face. This was a time when they were seeing that God seems to be hidden from them. The Syrians are about ready to come. And, and there, there's much turmoil and, and, and there's much reason to be afraid. And yet they're remnants trusting God. And in discipline and in difficult times, God is hiding his face from the remnant. But he calls us to trust him that he will appear once again to us. He wants us to wait. He wants us to hold on. He wants us to hold on in the dark when we don't know what's coming up next. When we don't know what, what is just around the corner. I mean, when see, and God may seem as if he's gone in the midst of such times. The remnant holds on. In fact, we don't have a lot of time because we don't want to go to the Lord's Supper. But look up Hebrews 2.13. It's quoted. This passage is quoted by and, and applied to Jesus. That he is, brings us as his children to himself. And that he names us as his brothers and sisters. And that it even says that he trusts in him. It quotes this. That Jesus had to go through what he's calling us to go through. Jesus held on and trusted his father when it looked like all was lost and the Assyrians were, not Assyrians here, but the Romans were coming upon him. When it looked as if God was gone and God had left him. When God was hiding, Jesus trusted. And Jesus waited for God's word to be fulfilled and his promise to be fulfilled. For us, he did this. We don't do it perfectly. But Jesus did, and he did it for us. Jesus also received a, a, a remnant, a, a group of children of God given to him, which is us, us. We share in his humanity. He shares in our humanity. We share in his, his, his saviorship so that he would die. Look at that passage in light of this passage this afternoon. And you'll see a number of things we'll have time to point out. Jesus is the remnant, ultimately, who trusts God in the diversity and the terrible and the stress of the worst of the stress. And he does it perfectly. He waits and trusts his Father. And the Lord's face does show again on the resurrection day, doesn't it? Jesus sees it. And we will see it too. And, and when we do this, when we trust God rather than, and, and, and fear him rather than other people, when we hold on to the word and when we wait for God, and when we trust him, when we run to him as our sanctuary, then we become signs and symbols amidst the visible church, amidst the world even beyond that, that we follow the Lord. It's almost like he's saying there's living sacraments here of people who live out the gospel in difficult times under discipline and they're seen by others and others are drawn to faith because of them. And that's what we are. Well, let me give you one last characteristic of this remnant. The remnant keep on running back to the word. Did you see that? They keep coming back to the law and testimony. They don't move on from the law. They don't leave the testimony behind. They build their lives on God's word. And the, but the worldly church looks everywhere else for guidance. The worldly church looks everywhere else for truth. They want to bring all the different religions together. And, and, and come up with their own truth. You heard it in the, the funeral service. I don't know if you watched it of President Bush. Did you hear what they said? What the 
priests said one time in quoting Jesus Christ instead of saying I am the resurrection when they were reading that portion in John 11 they just simply said I am resurrection I am life changing the word of God because it will sound a little bit easier on the ears of unbelievers that's what the worldly church, that's what Israel does. That's what the visible church that doesn't believe in the Lord will do. They'll change things and they won't stick to the word. They'll talk about everything else good and wonderful instead of what God says. But God says, this doesn't make sense that we have the Lord, that we would go to him and find out things from him, what he thinks and what he wants. Doesn't that make sense? Shouldn't a follower of God go to their God for guidance? We are so messed up sometimes, Christians. We're so, so wrong about this. We look for the answers in all the wrong places, even though we know the answers are in his word. Now, probably we don't go to mediums and spiritists. I hope you didn't go to one this week. I hope we could all say we didn't go and look to the dead to find out what you need to know from the Lord this week. I hope not, but maybe, maybe that's possible. But we go to other things. We go to friends instead of the Lord's word. We go to the inner light within us. We go to ourselves. We go to our common sins instead of to God's word. But all other words that do not confirm God's word will lead to wandering. Did you see this? In the end of the passage, to distress, to spiritual starvation, to frustration at their leaders and at God. It will lead to darkness. It will lead to gloom. All advice, all truth that doesn't agree with God's truth has, verse 20, no light of dawn. In other words, it's going nowhere. There's no tomorrow for it. There's no dawn for it. There's no future. There's no next day for it. It's, it's, it's going absolutely nowhere but into utter darkness, even into hell itself. But we'll see next week, and I wish we could fast forward the next week right away to go right into chapter 9 because that's such a, a lead into that. But in, in, and we'll see that Christ is the light that has dawned, that Christ is the one who helps us see who we really are. Christ is the one who comes and, and, and establishes his kingdom and we with it. Christ is the one that helps us understand who God really is. Because it's only in God's light that we see. It's only in God's word that we'll understand. And so it's a choice between our autonomy and God depending upon God. It's a choice of our wisdom and the world's wisdom rather than God's wisdom. It's a choice of saying, well, I believe what is best or believing that what God says is best. Even though we might not see how it works yet, we either stumble over God or we run to him, keep coming back, coming to his word, coming to him as our sanctuary. We either reject him or we're part of that remnant that knows we have rejected him. But now, he's welcomed us in Christ. Oh, come to Christ today. Christian, unbeliever, come to Christ today. He's there, the light in the midst of your darkness. He will shine. Turn to his light. And you will have the dawn to wait for, look forward to. You will have everything that God promises one day. Let's close in a word of prayer. Lord, we ask that you'd help us hear this word. There's so many deviations, so many ways in which we can go the other way. Help us, Lord, to make some decisions in our hearts right now, not just to hear this word, but to decide what we'll watch and what we won't watch, what we'll listen to and what we won't listen to, what we'll, we'll agree with and what we won't. Let us be your remnant, your invisible church, those whom you know are yours. Oh Lord, may your word stimulate us to fear you and to run to you and to wait upon you. Lord, to, to bind up those truths in our heart. Keep them. Oh Lord, may we do that. May you be your remnant in this time. And we ask it in Jesus' name.
Amen.